When I consider the authenticity of a film, I never ruminate on the director's motivations for the lengths and extremes undertaken to recreate a filter of genuineness through which we witness their vision. Many of my favorite films have been lauded for their historical authenticity, down to the minutest details, but I always presumed such effort was merely for spectacle, a wistful longing of years, centuries gone by. Is the director's endeavor towards perfecting authenticity an attempt to capture and forever enshrine upon film a moment in time that is already lost? It would seem such an undertaking is impossible to ever perfect due to susceptibility of embellishment, exaggeration, misinformation, omissions, and socio-politically skewed zeitgeist that may influence the spirit of the creativity. However, there is a movie that approaches very nearly to its own desire of perfect authenticity, whose ideas and underlying themes expand beyond the decade encapsulated within its three-hour length. That movie is Blood In, Blood Out, also known as Bound by Honor. And I have a few reasons why it's worth viewing. The backstory involving the making and release of the film holds as much fascination as the movie itself. The conflicting title suggests Hollywood didn't know how to treat the film during its time, and the titles also reflect the contrasting context within the film's story itself. These external factors have been openly discussed by the director, Taylor Hackford, in the Hollywood interview in Venice Magazine by Alex Simon in 2000-2001. Carlos Carrasco, who plays the role of Popeye, expands on the outside struggles by giving an in-depth and hilarious recounting to the Lowrider live show crew, and that interview can be found on YouTube. One of the biggest takeaways I got from Carlos was that Blood In Blood Out was filmed simultaneously with American Me, and the crews from both movies would often overlap each other. There is even a shared screenwriter that is credited for both scripts, although the final draft of Blood In Blood Out is mostly credited to Jimmy Santiago Baca. Yet the foundational influence of the shared screenwriter, the mutual shooting locations, and concurrent making of both films at the same time gives reason as to why American Me and Blood In Blood Out are notoriously compared and debated for being both similar, yet one being more highly regarded than the other. As for declaring one movie above the other, I'll leave it up to the viewer. But my interest lies in the overlooked complexities involving the characters and themes of Blood In, Blood Out. On its surface, this movie appears to follow a rather simplistic formula, and even the director's motivation for explicit authenticity seems conventional. Hackford wants to capture and reveal a genuine sense of Chicano culture in East LA, and the plot of the movie follows a stringent path of falling from grace to redemption through self-actualization. Everyone seems to have a happy enough ending, and the lessons given away are drugs affect more than just the user, family is forever, be proud of your culture, and beware the loss of your self-identity within the pack mentality. There may be more, but those appear to be the overarching tropes that Hackford sticks to. In fact, his simplistic approach is best summarized by the end of the film's credits when a final message fades in to state that all is well in the California prison system. This veneer of simplicity opens the film to criticism for lacking the depth needed to justify its running time. But after subsequent viewings, there emerges a woven tale of complications which subvert our human nature, challenging both the idea and ideal of what it means to be authentic. Striving for authenticity goes beyond the world building of the film, beyond the cultural immersion, and delves into the heart of the three main characters, Paco, Cruz, and Miklo. Their journey throughout the movie echoes the immemorial directive of the Oracle of Delphi, Know Thyself. The struggle for self-identification is clearly evident in each of their stories, providing a reflection of the differing paths we all take from our childhood through adulthood based on the choices we make and the external forces of our environment. Herein lies one of the film's most interesting complexities, the contrast of its character's development. 
The story of the three main characters appears as a straightforward tale of their personas and place in life, doing a 180. Young Paco is introduced as a hardcore gangbanger, hating cops and wanting to represent the street life, but older Paco actually becomes a detective, hating the street gangs and their activities. He's presented as a hard, tough guy who's finally allowed to cry by the movie's end. Cruz is a lovable artist and peacemaker of the group. Throughout the movie, he's constantly trying to discourage the other two characters from confrontation and expresses himself through his painting. But by the end, he is presented as strong and carefree, ready to fight anything life will throw at him and expresses his new worldview through an encouraging monologue to Paco. Finally, Miklo is consistently shown as wanting to belong to a family, striving to prove himself worthy to others time and again. He's the unconventional anti-hero that surprises everyone who ever dismissed him by gaining ultimate power and respect within the prison system. Although Hackford winds the threads of all three characters in and out of the movie, there's more to ascertain from them on an individual level. For instance, Paco is a former boxer who went by the nickname Black Rooster. The name is suitable as Paco struts throughout his scenes with a cocky attitude, a characteristic that is not subject to change, even from youth into adulthood. However, a rooster is still a chicken, and chicken is a word associated with fear, and it is fear that fuels Paco's motivation. But what does Paco fear? He fears weakness, especially his own. When the main trio is accosted by the police, Cruz is able to charm them away by bragging about Paco's boxing record and doesn't understand why the Black Rooster wouldn't be proud to be recognized. It's because Paco broke his wrists, and to bring up his former accomplishments in the sport only serve as a reminder of the physical weakness that forever impairs him from reaching his boxing potential. The once great fighter becomes identified by his injury and what could have been. Emotionally, Paco holds back his tears and never admits his wrongness until the end because crying and apologies are a sign of weakness within archetypical masculinity. Yet above all else, Paco's fear of weakness is driven home after the death of his little brother, as he was powerless to stop it from happening, just as he was powerless to prevent Cruz's injury. Of course, there was nothing he could have done, but his ego and pride will not let him accept that he may even hate the weakness he sees in those who cannot help themselves. Thus, he becomes a hardened cop, leading a crusade against the drugs and drug peddlers plaguing the streets of his barrio. Paco's character journey is more about the tough guy who must learn to cry. Paco shows that it is better to be strong than hard. Anyone can be hard, but strength takes effort. Hardness breaks, but strength endures. If Paco represents the process of Chicano enculturation into mainstream American society, where heritage and tradition fall behind a strict adherence to the rule of law and conformity, then Cruz personifies the aspect of Chicano mythology and lore. The introduction of Cruz has him relating the legend of the kingdom called Atslan and the poet king's return to a modern day America. His art gallery is a celebration of the Chicano people in everyday life coated with a sublime sense of mystique that is beautifully familiar to one community, yet falls into a misconstrued infatuation by the greater public. When tragedy strikes, it is at a time when Cruz is most discontent with the mechanized autonomy his artistry has devolved into. Death's arrival is profound because the loss of a young life is surrounded by painted replicas of age-old Aztec patterns and form, relegating the agent's reclamation of this world to a lost cause, and diminishing the inherent creativity within Cruz. Pride of heritage requires an inner freedom and independence, but Cruz is stifled by the external influences of exploitation which manipulate his motivations in a way that he himself is unaware. Cruz says he uses drugs for his back pain, but the deeper pain is the loss of his artistic potential, as we never see him use his scholarship to pursue a scholarly path and he finds himself as a mere cog in the engine of the faceless art industry. The loss of family compounds his already broken spirit, leaving him obsessed with the surrealism of death. Ultimately, the embrace of the same family that shunned him helps to restore his sense of belonging and a sense of self. 
Cruz returns to his artistic roots, and the imagery of antiquity develops into a new mythos embedded in today's youth who carry the blood of the ancients, living legends in their own time that may yet usher in their own kingdom of Aztlan. As for Miklo, he garners the majority of the film's screen time and portrays a fascinating maturation of character development. Of course, the main focus is on Miklo's rise from the bottom to the top of the pecking order, but the details reveal the unconventional way he goes about doing so. To say Miklu is a social chameleon is an understatement because he does more than simply adapt to his various environments. Miklu seems to learn from his encounters with danger. He almost seems to absorb the essence of his adversaries, which alters his persona with newfound character traits. Before the showdown with Spider in Tres Puntos, Miklu is naive and merciful, but after that finds himself striking back against Popeye, willing to die in combat just as Spider was. He even takes on the metaphorical aspects of a spider by weaving a murderous web to catch Big Al, and Miklo does this by wearing the mask of friendship, just as Popeye did to lure him into a false sense of security. Miklo then assumes the role of Big Al by taking control of the prison's gambling network on behalf of La Onda, and uses his financial knowledge of the incurred debts and high stakes of everyone across the racial spectrum to further his own advancement in the prison gang. From the boss at his dead-end job, he learns how to utilize another man's shameful past to call his bluff and how to leverage absolute power to make a man compliant. He performs these exact techniques in his next scene with Popeye and Clavo. When Miklo returns to prison, he retains all of the skills and attributes he has gained, but his previous encounter during a robbery gone wrong makes a lasting and most significant impression upon him. Miklo now embodies the spirit of young Paco, full of unbridled anger, searching for absolute respect, and willing to remove any other competitors that stand in the way of his rise to dominance. His calculated manipulations and intricate design for a prison takeover run parallel to Paco's vengeful scheme for trapping Spider and eradicating Tres Puntos, but executed on a larger scale. Despite obtaining the power, respect, and belonging he always sought, Miklo's self-actualization remains unclear, because he may have self-sacrificed his identity for the collective, for La Onda. Self-reproach, self-pity, self-loathing? This movie is a study in the perceptions and misconceptions of self-identity, and that study expands to the Chicano experience Hackford blends into the character's environment. However, no matter the intention of the film's authenticity, the impact is a revelation of the ignorance and indifference toward other people's cultures. Blood in, blood out doesn't just display racial intolerance, but also an apathetic approach to understanding one another. Bonafide declares a deeper significance to the symbol of his afro pig. Popeye finds it meaningless, as Bonafide knew he would. The policemen only see a pretty picture on Cruz's car. The same as the gawkers and onlookers at the art gallery who see the Chicano-inspired paintings as a means for profit and socializing. Paco's partner shows a desperate lack of understanding when it comes to the culture of the very people he's sworn to protect and the ones he must arrest. Instead, he shields his unfamiliarity with witty cynicism. And despite the painstaking details of authenticity that Hackford builds, the closing shots of the credits illuminate an even larger world that carries on indifferent to the main characters and the Chicano culture, as it all becomes lost in the bigger perspective. Blood In, Blood Out provides a contrasting outlook for the future, both hopeful and nihilistic. The film lavishes in its portrayal of genuine subcultures. Meanwhile, the main characters wrestle with their own sense of authenticity, to not only know thyself, but to be thyself. A notion put forward by professor and author Yoriel Abeluf he states, don't just settle for telling your story, connecting your identity to the here and now, to yourself and others, to then and there. Become aware of it, get to know the story, so you can both defend it and reflect upon it, be able to justify or refute it. Amid this search for self-identity, the film very delicately underscores the actions and outcomes of the characters by questioning if everything and everyone is actually self-liberated or beholden to a predetermined fate. Was Miklo destined to become a leader of La Onda? 
Was Cruz destined to sink into depravity in order to have his epiphany? Was the rebellious young Paco destined to a life of law-abiding conformity in his adulthood? Is the human condition truly independent, free to make anything of one's life? Or are we all caught in a path of preordainment, like an oncoming wave we cannot avoid nor outrun? The wave that moves the world, the wave of destiny. Hey guys, if you made it this far, then I'm proud of you. This movie was a lot of fun to dissect and research and just watch. And there's so much more that could be said about it. I do want to thank the following viewers for suggesting the movie for us to review. Richard Rude, Jay Champ, Driveway Built, Jesus Avila, Julian. Thanks again for the recommendation. And keep in mind, we here at Same Differences will happily review analyze or discuss any movie, music, TV show, comic, or entertainment topic. So leave a comment anywhere to let us know. We'll be back with more. And as always, likes, subs, and shares are greatly appreciated. Thanks to all of our subscribers. We'll see you next time.